We say that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Jesus is Lord over our lives. Jesus is Lord over our family. Jesus is Lord. Amen. We submit ourselves to the great and wonderful Father who loves us so. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus, to be our Savior, to be our sacrifice, thank you. that we might have everlasting life, healing, salvation, deliverance, abundance, peace in our hearts and peace in our minds. We thank you for the for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We just give you glory and honor. We love you, Lord. You are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, speak. You are welcome. Move among us, Father. You are welcome in this place. We speak a blessing over our pastor as she prepares to break the bread of life. Father, we thank you that her word will be your words. Her word would be gracious, and they would be good, and they would be correcting, and they would be encouraging. Father, we also thank you for the finances that we have in our lives. We take what you have given us. All that we have comes from you, and we return a small portion back to you. We bring you our tithes. We bring you our offerings, Father, that they may be meat in your house. You told us to bring it and to prove you, to see if you would not pour out a blessing more than we should be able to receive. So we give because we love you. Let this offering be used to spread your gospel into the world. Let this offering go and bring provision for those who are homeless and those who are lost and those that are without. We thank you, Father. We bring to your house. We don't want your house to be like and we give you glory and we give you honor have your way with this message and we humble ourselves to receive the message that we might be changed that we will continually be changed into the image of your son jesus christ we give you glory and honor and praise to our god in jesus name i pray amen, amen. amen. you may be seated Good morning, everyone. So glad to see everyone out this morning. Good morning to everyone in, out there in Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to Covenant Messiah Church, where Pastor Debbie Grower is our senior pastor here. My name is Luis Perez. I am the assistant pastor here. And um, welcome to this service today. Um, do we have any first-time visitors in the building today? If there's any first-time, oh, welcome. Welcome, so glad that you're in our presence. And I'd like to welcome all our first-time visitors out on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome. Um, and of course, welcome to our regulars here. We love you. I uh, just want to remind everyone that uh, Pastor Deb does have a Tuesday Bible study. Uh, currently, she is going through the book of Luke. She is in uh, chapter 8. And that particular Bible study can be seen on Facebook, Facebook Live, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. You can also go to our Covenant Messiah Church website. And when you go there, you can also find it streaming there. And you can also go to our YouTube channel. Uh, our plans this week is to finish chapter 8. And... Um, Pastor Deb has been doing a wonderful job with the book of Luke. Ladies, Hannah's Heart is meeting on a regular basis. Uh, they're meeting every Saturday morning at 8.30 a.m. It's a, uh, they're meeting by telephone conference. So on a weekly basis, there is an email that goes out with the specific phone number for you to dial. You can see, also see it up on the screen. And we've given you the access code. You enter the access code and you enter pound sign and all you ladies will be linked together over the telephone and you can come together in prayer. So very powerful meeting and I would really recommend it for all the ladies. Uh, repairs of the breach, that is a ministry that uh, ministers to the homeless in Camden. Uh, 
Rob and Michelle Campos uh, uh, lead that particular ministry, and they're going out weekly. And um, if you would like to go out with them, you can reach out to them. And if you'd just like to support the ministry to the homeless in Camden, you can go to their Facebook page, uh, Repairs of the Breach. There's an Amazon link there. They've already selected items that they need, and you can just drop the items in the shopping cart, and the items get delivered to their home, and then they can prepare the packages for the people. We also have a list of the items that they're giving away. They're, they're, that list is at the back table, and you can just pick up the list of the things that they need, and then you can bring it to the church. Um, and if you have any items today, there's a table in the vestibule in the foyer area. You can just drop it there, and, and Rob and Michelle will, will pick it up from there. Amen? Wonderful ministry. We're so thankful that they're here with us and we're able to partner with them to bless God's children in the world. Amen. Amen. That's what Amen. we're called to do, love on each other, and that will involve ministry to needs. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your continued support of this ministry. And I just want to remind you of the different ways you can bring your tithes and offerings to the house of God. You can use your cell phone and text the word GIVE to 856-997-2303 and then you'll be prompted, follow the prompts and you can give, bring your tithes and offerings via that way. You can also um, go to our website, covenantmessiah.com <clears throat> and uh, there's a tab on there that says donate, follow the prompts and you can give that way. You can also write a check. Uh, when you address your envelope, you can address it to CMC, Covenant Messiah Church, P.O. Box 5680, Deptford, New Jersey, 08096. And for those of us in the building, uh, you can place your offerings in the back. There's a basket at the, uh, at the table. So when we dismiss today, uh, you can just drop your tithes and your offerings back there. And that's all the um, announcements I have, Pastor Deb. We're ready for you right now. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, it's so yeah. good. That won't be for long, right? The sun is flying. It really is. We're in the middle of summer. Yeah. Crazy. The 19th of July. Wow. There's not many more weeks left, but I don't know about you. I'm loving nice hot weather and we didn't want that. <laughs> yeah, I do like it. It's much better than freezing cold and icy roads and all that good stuff, right? But if we were to tarry, we'll by faith have to deal with that too, won't we? But um, I sure hope that you've had a great week and um, that you're getting Psalm 91 in your heart. You know, we're about to move into something else, but I just really hope that you are taking seriously the um, challenge to get that, memorize it, have it just mm -hmm. as a ready writer, David said, that may his tongue be the pen of a ready writer. May that be your um, testimony as you keep Psalm 91 in your heart. With that being said, I'm going to have Pastor Louise come back up. He's going to coach us going on one of the last times, right? Yeah, That's Psalm 91. We're going to do all 16 verses. Why don't you stand up, just stretch one more time and let him lead us in that. No handouts. Let's see if we can, if we have it memorized. Right? <laughs> I have my spotter in the back. Spotter. Just in case. Hold on. Your spotter. The spotter. <laughs> Ready?
It's not just there because it's poetic and a nice place to put that. It's because it's the most important part of the 16 verses, mm -hmm. that we are dwelling in that place, that we're staying there, we're living. We found out that living in him means to stay in him. Yeah. It doesn't mean to come and go. It doesn't mean you're living in him on Sundays at 11, but you're not... You're leaving that secret place on the rest of the days of the week. It's a consistency. And, and I have to say that that is so true with the entire walk that we have as believers. Consistency. Sometimes people think, well, you know, that doesn't work. I tried that. Well, you know what? It's, it's, it's not trying it. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. It's a consistency that we do day in and day out, hour by hour. And that's where the song was birthed. I need thee every hour, right? Mm -hmm. And we certainly, the longer we walk with him, the more we see the depravity of the world and just the unstableness of everything around us. He is the only thing that is unshakable and Amen. the only thing that is stable in our lives. And so we want to stay in that secret place, don't we? Stay inside. So would you say with me out loud, he is my God. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my, fortress. my God. My in him, him, him I trust. I trust. In him we trust. We have to stay in there, stay in that place to find that. We also found out some things that, that will, can affect our protectiveness is fear. Fear of any kind is not to be tolerated. Because we found out that fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Mm -hmm. We found out that fear is like contraband. We should not at all be caught with it at all because it's detrimental. It's the opposite of who the Lord is. There is no fear in the kingdom. There's no fear in God. The only fear there is is a reverence and an awe of his holiness and who he is. Um, we found out that another way God uses to protect us through the psalm is through angels. Amen. We just read the psalm Amen. that he gives his angels charge over us. And we found out what angels were and how they operate and how they flow. Last week, we took a little bit of a step out of the psalm and we looked at warnings. Mm -hmm. Warnings. That God does protect us through warning. He guides us through those. And now this week, it's kind of a segue, if you will, a part two maybe from last week. And yet it's very different at the same time. But it's definitely another viewpoint of looking at Psalm 91. And we, we want to we capsize in our lives. God wants to protect us. God is a protector. Yeah. It's who he is. But we have a part to play in it. Yeah. We have a part to play in it. And then you might say, well, that's not the grace message because it's all God. Well, it is all God. But you can't get saved without faith to believe who right. Jesus is. Right, right. So there's always a part we play in releasing our faith, if you will, or our understanding. And so there's always that now our part. Believing is something we have to do even to enter into the eternal and final work and finished work of God. So that's where we're going this week. Kind of a little bit of a part two, but definitely another lens as we're getting. We're looking at the protectiveness. How can we be a little bit more mindful of the desire God has to protect us. Amen. And remember, before we went, we have a part to play. We got to stay in the secret place. We got to stay out of fear. Yeah. We got to be aware that there's angels around us. Yeah. We got to say with our mouths, yeah. I will say of the Lord. We yeah. just confess that. Our mouth is a very big part of how we live because yeah. life and death is in the power of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if we don't like the life we've got, think about what you're thinking about, think about what you're saying. Because yeah. you know, Mark 11 says you're going to have what you say. Yes, yes. We're speaking spirits just like Jesus is, just Amen. like God is. We're made in his image. Right. And our words have power. Amen. You would have to argue with the word where it says in Proverbs 18, life and death power. are in that power. Our tongue is powerful. So in the psalm is a mention of our words. It's a mention of what we say. Amen? Yeah. So let's let's start looking at a little further today, this little this little lens, secondary lens to look at. So this is the narrative we're going to be looking at in Matthew 4. It's what we're going to go to first today. And this is the narrative that immediately follows Jesus' water baptism. Okay? Um, and the word says um, sometimes these little little words you need to really see in your Bibles because 
you might not in your own estimation of the scripture think it says what it says. And this has always been an amazing portion of scripture to me where it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, we always think the devil's leading us into the wilderness. Right. But wilderness experiences always refine us. We either become better out of them or we become bitter or worse out of them. Right. But they always bring out what's in us. And then we have the option to transform into more like Christ's image Amen. in that wilderness experience. Amen. And Jesus, you know, again, remember, we're going to be looking at some things that Jesus went through, and we're looking at him not as God, because what we're about to study from the life of Christ is him as a man. Amen. Right. Him as a man. So he's already showing us the way, right? By what? He went through water baptism. Anybody in this room has not been water baptized, you can't be greater than Jesus. If you haven't been water baptized, you need to do that because Jesus himself went through those waters Amen. to be baptized. Amen. Amen. So Amen. see me after class today if that's something you desire to do or those of you that are on Facebook Live. So he is led into the wilderness and he's led there and the Bible says for 40 days and 40 nights he was tempted from Satan. Now, as we, many of you have read that, those three temptation statements. But see, the Bible says it was done for 40 days and 40 nights. It wasn't just three. You know, and again, this brings back a, a verse, I believe it's in the book of uh, the Gospel of John, where it says, all the things that Christ did and said couldn't be recorded in the book we're reading because it would take all the library books of the world to fill up all that he said and all he did. So I'm excited to go to eternity because we're going to start filling in some blanks, right? Yeah. Or some things that we never really were able to get a grasp yeah. of and to really understand and learn here. But here we know Jesus was tempted. I, I, you know, I, 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 I kind of feel angry about that in one side of me because it's like, how dare Satan tempt my Savior like that? But see, he had to go through that. Yeah. Because then you could go through it because he went Amen. through it. Okay? Amen. Right. So for 40 days, and where I want to stop, you now I'll take a peek at this, is one of those times in the temptation of Christ, he used Psalm 91 yeah. to tempt them. Amen. Amen. So it's a great yeah. place for us to take a little stop here, a little God stop, and take a little visual here and find out, well, why did he use that? What, what was it about that? And what was that scripture? And just take a little moment. He quoted the devil. Can you imagine? Quoted scripture. Yeah. I mean, you might be thinking, the devil knows scripture? Sure. Sure. Oh, my goodness. Positively. He even comes to church. That's right. That's right. No, it's not your neighbor, so don't, don't get there. Yes. I don't think, anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, he comes to church. He knows scripture. He's been around a long time. He is wise from that perspective just because of antiquity. Right. Sure. He doesn't have wisdom, but he's wise because he has seen and he's been around and he knows and he's heard and he's learned, right? But he right. used scripture against the Savior. And that's why it's so important for you and I to know scripture. Because we're going to see how Jesus handled that. And how he handled it is so important for us because we need to handle things the way Jesus handled yeah. in this very scenario yeah. that we're going to talk about. We need to, the Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah. What does that exactly mean? I'm so glad you asked. To rightly <laughs> divide scripture, it means we use other scriptures. Right, right, right. In, I don't know of a case where there's a principle in the word of God that sits alone. Because the word says, with two or three witnesses, every truth is established. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you hear someone come to you prophetically and say, you know, the Lord told me, or I saw a vision, and I saw you doing this, that, and the other, it should always be a confirmation. Right. You want to be hearing from God first. Mm -hmm. And anyone yeah. that comes, it should be just a confirmation of what you've already heard. You are very up for deception and possible... Um, distraction if you just follow somebody's thought they have on what God said to them about you. Hmm. Always has to be a confirmation. Amen? I don't know who that's yes. for. Went off a little bit of my notes just to go there, but he knows scripture. He doesn't rightly divide it. He uses it for his 
pride. He uses it for deception. All right. That's a mouthful right there. Because we know the word's true, but the devil can use it to deceive. Amen. Something to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not even taking a say on myself as I'm saying that. Mm. Why? Because he can twist it. Because he can use it out of context. Right. He can use it singularly and then make this blanket doctrine that you ought to follow. And guess what? Satan doesn't come around in a red suit. And do, to do that, he comes by the usage of some woman or man or right. a human being right. to masquerade his deception in it. Sure, sure. So what am I saying? So sometimes you can be told something from pulpits or you can be told something from Amen. you know, blogs or listening to YouTubes or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And there's a motive there that's not totally truth of God's word. Amen. It's twisted in a way to, to be used as a device to distract and to take you off the truth trail. Yeah. Okay? And we want to be on the truth trail, don't we? So how do we know that? It's important for you to know the word so that when you hear something like that, you can know if it's confirmed in other places in the Bible or it's contradicted because of other places in the Bible. Amen. Gotta know the word to be able to do that. Or you'll be tricked. You'll be, you'll be deceived. And this is what he tried to do with the Savior. The Bible is its own commentary. Yes. The Bible will answer the Bible's questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we take the time to dig and stay on that truth trail, we'll find that out. Yes. So the devil is going to say some things to, 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 to Jesus. And one of the first things that Jesus says in, con in concurring what I just said to you about you know, different places in the Bible, uh, you know, give it validity. Jesus himself said that because he said to the enemy, it is also written. Amen. It is also written. You know, up until today, or this week preparing, you know, for this message, I always quoted that where he would just say, it is written, it is written. And I've said that many times, but it's even more pointed than it is written. It says it is also written. Amen. That's, that's such a powerful truth because Jesus knew the book as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Not just one single Amen. standing scripture to be confused with. Amen? So let's see it. Amen. Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses five and six. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Somebody told me today it's about 45 feet high. Um, and said to him, said to him, here we go again, the enemy speaks. He has a voice. Wow. Okay? Amen. If you are, uh -huh. usually Satan has more questions than periods. Because he Amen. wants you to doubt and you to come up with your own period. Mm. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Imagine. I mean, let's just take a moment. We've been studying Psalm 91. And since Jesus is the author of Psalm 91, he's been studying a lot longer than we have. He's the author of the actual phraseology or the scripture, right? But this devil, this one that is known as a liar, a liar from the beginning, the father of lies, there is no truth in him, the word tells us, right? Amen. Imagine, he tells the word of God, mm -hmm. the word of God, and tells him to jump off. Mm -hmm. This is audacity to the nth degree, isn't it? I mean, this is just like so amazing. And he takes him to this highest place of all to do it. But I want you to see here is that Jesus was indeed tempted. See, so this is where we get off track a little bit because we think, we see the word, the temptation of Christ in the Mount of Temptation, but we really don't think Jesus was tempted for real. Like, I mean, we read it, but not for real. Sure. I mean, because he was God. Sure. You know, the church, but you got to understand, he wasn't God here. Amen. He was just as tempted as anybody in this room in a, in, a, in, a, in a weakness that maybe we all have a little adversity to. And, of course, we're all being brought from glory to glory. 
right? Amen. But, but mm -hmm. Satan knows our little spots. You know, they could be traumatic past. They could be just image issues, whatever. Sure. And, and here's the thing. It's like he tempted. Jesus was tempted. Amen. I, I want you to just soak that in. I mean, there's so much to learn about Christ, right? But here, right. look at the humanity side of Christ, that he subjected himself to temptation. And may I take us a little further to another level of glory. He was tempted, Hebrew says, in all points. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just tempted to jump off a pinnacle. He was tempted in everything. I mean, just let your imagination go with that. Just some things that you've been tempted with in your world or those that are around you that you know have been tempted with. He was tempted with all of that. I mean, you know what? I'm giving you some extra. I always do with this service, you know? I, I, I can't even imagine in the spirit. Will we see that in, in heaven? Like, will we see that with, with, with a glorified body and spiritual eyes that are fully open and not looking dim in a glass anymore? But full face to face, will we really see in the spirit what Christ looked like on the cross? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We will. Every, every sin. See, he didn't yield to the temptation, but we do. Right. So he took what he didn't yield to. He took all of our temptations that we do yield to yeah. and took that even though he didn't. Mm -hmm. So he had the feeling of temptation, but he got the suffering of our, of what we yielded to. Amen. Wow. Amen. I wonder if that's one of the things. Well, what in the spirit will we say what the disciples said in Luke 8? Will we get a glimpse of that? And will we say, what manner of man is this? Mm -hmm. I, I, the depths of his love. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, it's just, it reckons with your brain. Like, it's beyond anything we can even fathom and take in and imagine. And we just get glimpses. And we go from glory to glory as we sang. And there's another glory to go. And it'll never be the end of the glories. Right. Ever. Amen. That's what eternity, I think, is all about. It's just, it will take eternity Hallelujah. to just. Go glory to the glory to the next glory to the next glory, glory. right? And have glory. the comprehension to be able to comprehend it. Glory. It's absolutely amazing. And so he was tempted is what I want you to see. Legitimately. And we know just from our textbooks, I mean, if you open up to Matthew 4, there's a heading, if you have a study Bible, that says the temptation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It happened on a place called the temptation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's legit. Now, there are all kinds of applications here, right here in this scripture that we're looking at. All kinds of little rabbit trails we could go down, many we have in the past together. One we could look about, as we look at this, is the authority of the word. Can anybody speak the word when it comes to pass? Your Satan is speaking the word. We, we could take a rabbit trail. We could go down there if we don't have time, so we're not going to. We could also take a look at authority. Does Satan have the authority to speak the word of God? Who has the greater authority? Is God up there having arm wrestling matches with, you know, Satan every day? Oh, you won this day. Oh, I won this day. No way. Is it, is it finished? Yeah, it is finished. But one thing I, want to, I do want to draw your attention here to, because I think it's something in this room, certainly collectively in the world and certainly in the body of Christ. The other thing we could take a little bit on, we could look at Satan attacking Jesus' identity. Look at this. If you are the son of God, trust me, Satan knew, he knows clear well who Jesus Christ is. Okay? If you are. See, he was challenging Jesus. He was tempting Jesus to what? Prove that. I think we're taking a hold of this better this session than, than the earlier one. This is what the makeup of a life that is just not full of joy is about. When we think we got to constantly prove something to somebody. Amen. we got to constantly Amen. prove our identity. Mm -hmm. 
we got to keep doing this and doing that and doing so and so and such and such and something else. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it, we keep hearing, if you really are. Mm -hmm. So we think if we keep doing stuff, that that's going to not only convince others around us, but, but ourselves too. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, if you, do, if you have the assurance of your identity in Christ, you don't got to prove nothing to nobody, no right. man or devil. Amen, amen. 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 So we could talk about that, couldn't we? Yeah. And he still does that today. He yeah. is still in the ear of the little Christ in the church saying, if you really are, yeah. then why is this like that? Mm -hmm. Why is this not happening the way this word says here it should? Mm -hmm. But I want to focus on something a little different, and that is that Jesus was tempted to do this. And let's explore why he was tempted, or why he potentially was tempted to do this, okay? So it's important, if it's here, for us to get a little depth of our understanding of it. Again, verse 6. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. Right away, prove it to me. That's what Satan was really saying. And then he goes off on a scriptural stance to get Jesus to do the word and take confidence on the covering that would be there out of the word. Is this intriguing? I think it's very intriguing. Let's see what verse 7 says. And Jesus answered him and said, it is also written. Uh -huh. Or it is written also. <clears throat> Going back to Jesus had a workability with the entire word of God. Amen. Not just some little verse, verse 7, that, that somebody can take out of context and twist it and use it for what they want you to do. All right, right, right. Uh -huh. And trust me, Satan wanted Jesus out of the way. Definitely. Right? But Jesus had to go through what he went through. His calling was higher than the devil or not the devil Amen. because he wants you to be victorious. Amen. He wants you to know your identity. Amen. He wants you to know that be careful. Be careful that you don't pick out one scripture and based a whole, there, there's, do you know that there are actual churches mm -hmm. that are based on one scripture mm -hmm. that was in disagreement with someone else's? Mm -hmm. Whole churches are built upon that. Mm -hmm. We got a family, we got to have a workable knowledge to the Amen. whole word of God. Yeah. We got to understand the genericness of it. We got to understand the history of it. There's a lot to learn together, isn't there? Sure but guess is. what? We're all winners out of it. Amen. We all become winners out of it. Amen. But this is so interesting. This is so interesting that that he says that it is also written. Amen. That's going to settle the case. Amen. Okay. Jesus, as we know, didn't jump off the pinnacle, did he? No. We all know he didn't do it. For one thing, we don't want to follow the devil's direction. I don't care how many scriptures he knows. Amen. And we better know what voice is speaking those things in our mind. We need to know the difference. Yeah. Sure. But, but, but what about this temptation? What is the temptation and what about it? I mean, of course Jesus believes there are angels. Amen. My gosh, he was in eternity. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. he totally came to earth as an incarnate, right? Yeah. He was an eternity, of course he did. The angels have been swinging around saying, holy, 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 for as long as he remembers. And well, his, time of his existence was ever around. And you know what else? Of course he believes in angels because the word tells us on the cross. He could have called a legion of them. Amen. Amen. So he believes in them. Sure he believes they can come down and swoop them up. You know, if he jumps, they'll just come and whisk them away and all you'll see is angel dust. <laughs> and then the angels can cake afterwards. As they watch it, right? Of course he believes in all of that. That they will bear him up lest he dash his foot or hit his foot against the stone. So what's this temptation all about? Can, 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 I, just, can I just bring this down? Yeah. The temptation is when somebody around you or you yourself and the author really being Satan says, prove it. Mm. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. Mm. Oh, you're a faith person? Prove it. Amen. Church, when you hear that, 
when you feel that you need to prove your faith somewhere that is the devil operating behind the scenes the devil operating behind the scenes now you might say well wait a minute pastor Jeff, doesn't james say that faith without works is dead i know that some of you might be thinking we're going to get to that just bear with me as we go through this line upon line did he try to convince the devil or try to prove to him he had faith in some way? No. No. Um, no. Did he have an argument with the devil? No. Did he have well, a discussion with the devil other than to bring up the word? Was he afraid to jump? No. No. Because the truth is the angels would come. But he was being tempted Amen. by Satan. And he said earlier that if he did that, it would tempt God. Okay? Listen, my family, you and I don't have to prove a single thing to the devil. Amen. Not a single thing. Nor are you and I or us required to, to prove to other people that we have that. Amen. 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 Nowhere does it say we have to prove our faith to anyone. Amen. Not even God says prove it. Because God already knows every thought and intent of your heart and your mind. We don't have to prove anything. And he knows before we even know there's an issue or a problem or something good. Amen. And yet here Jesus is tempted. And I, I want to just say this. It's not a sin to be tempted. Mm -hmm. Jesus was sinless his entire life. Right. And yet he was tempted here. So we can tell just by the, if Jesus had any sin in his life, he could not have went to the cross and redeemed us. Amen. So therefore, this, we can conclude from that, that temptation is not a sin. Because if it Amen. is, he'd, he'd be a sinner. Right. Sure. He's not. So temptation is not a sin. It's when we act upon that temptation. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. In fact, again, Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in every point, in every way. And the Bible says, yet he sins not. Meaning, it's the yielding and the actual giving into it that really where the sin comes from. He did not yield to it. And you know what? I'm here to tell you today, you ought to be so thankful. We ought to be so happy. But because he did not yield to that temptation or any other temptation, all points, remember, we don't have to either. Amen. Because he wasn't up on that mountain as God. He was up on that mountain as a Holy Spirit-filled man. Amen. And because he had victory over the temptation, so can we. Amen. Amen. I, I, you know, I've had drugs hit our family life a little bit. You know, we could have a conversation openly with each other in the room. And I'm sure there's been other things that you've dealt with in your family, dealing with temptations and, and, and maybe even getting over, coming some of that. You know what? Sometimes temptation stays. But can I just say, this is the answer for it. I, you know, I, I'm not an expert on the 10 steps, 12 steps, 20 steps. I know that those 10 steps or 12 steps better have Jesus in every one of them. Because he's the only one yeah. who overcame temptation and didn't yield to it. And if we placed ourselves, here we go back again, if we place ourselves in the secret place, in him, and we stay in him, we won't yield to it either. Because we're living in a place of victory in him. Yes. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. That's why we have the victory. Look Amen. at verse 7 again. Amen. Jesus said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other translations, the music, the King James says, do not tempt. Do not tempt the Lord your God. Amen. So he's saying here that very interesting thing having to do with this, this temp temptation situation. He verifies that it's tempting God for me to prove to you I have faith. Mm -hmm. Can we go a little further? Mm -hmm. First, before we go any further, say with me, I don't want to tempt God. I don't, I, don't I don't want to tempt God. I think that's a Bible study all this time. What, what does that actually mean? But it's in the Word. It's in the Word. Does it, does it release our protection to some degree? Because we start taking matters in our own hands and walking by works yeah. and working by doing 
instead of staying in the secret place, letting him be our defender, letting him do everything that needs to be done. Do we have to come to the battle? We're going to read at the very end of this, this time today that Proverbs tells us that the horse is prepared for the battle. Amen. Give it stuff we got to do in the midst of Amen. this. You better wear a mask. <laughs> but ultimately, the Lord gets the glory. Amen. Because every warning, every protective feature, every part of Psalm 91 and anything that, that has to do with human protection, he's the victorious one. Amen. Because he overcame the way he overcame. Yeah. So let's go a little place with this. I see a lot of folks make this mistake. I really do. It can be a combination of pride and a combination of ignorance. Have you heard, I'm sure you have, have you heard stories about people who've done foolish things in the name of faith? Sure. Anybody? Amen. I, I know people throw away their medication. They, they get born again, and they come into the faith, and they start learning a little bit about faith, and then it's like it gets carried to a, an extreme of spiritual pride, if you will. Sure. Somewhere along the line, that we, we come to the conclusion that medication is not walking by faith. Mm -hmm. Which is not true. Mm -hmm. God uses, there's nothing that was made that he did not make. Mm -hmm. Everything that we might think that's the world and this is God. No, the world is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do you know people? Throw away their medication because, oh, they're they want to be this faith person. Well, it's stupid. With a capital S. That's exactly what it is. Some people, you know, the, 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 well, I've got pain. The doctor said I need my, my gallbladder out. But you know what? I'm standing in faith. I'm not going to have that done. I'm just going to stand here in faith until you have a ruptured gallbladder. Sometimes God uses, you know, again, part two of last week, these warnings and simple instructions. He used Pharaoh to release and bring his will to pass in a couple million Hebrew children. It doesn't always have to come through the church, but it's always for the church. Yeah. May not come through it, but it's always for the church, okay? All I'm trying, I mean, people just try to want to prove I have faith. That's sometimes what people do. They want to prove it, and they get caught up in this, and it can be very dangerous. When you feel you've got to prove things, you know what's happening? You're moving right into works. Sure. And when James says faith without works is dead, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the consequential fruit of faith is you're going to have an outward expression of it. It doesn't mean you start doing things to verify your faith. You can't, you can't go to heaven by works, can you? That's the whole reason we need a Savior. And people do this all the time. We need to be careful not to think that everything that involves Jesus by faith has to be a, a, a spectacular spectacle. And I think sometimes we think that. Sure. I think if we don't see a spectacle, we that's like lesser faith. Like if there's big faith, there's a bigger spectacle. Well, no, not really. No, not really at all. Listen, I don't care if you and I and all of us have a three-foot bronze Psalm 91 plaque hanging in your ass. You know, that you show everybody when you walk in that you've memorized it. Listen, if the Lord wakes you up in the middle of the night for you to hear a thunderclap coming down your street, and you've got your umbrella up out on your deck and your glass table sitting right by your pool. And you go, you know what, Leska, I'm standing in faith. That thing ain't coming near my house. I'm just going to stay up here in my bed and I'm going to speak to that thing. I'm going to rebuke that wave. Well, that might work out for you. But most of the time, the storm's coming anyway. And you should have went down and closed the umbrella and took your glass table away so you don't have glass all in your bowl. I don't know why that didn't work. I tried that faith thing. It doesn't work. <laughs> Sometimes the simple things, just little instructions. Instead of move, getting up, getting out of the flesh. See, sometimes we want to say, I just stood against that thing. And then people say, oh, Debbie, have you heard 
that her faith lives? So does God get the glory or does Debbie get the glory? Mm. Remember, it's he that dwells in the secret place. Okay? So that when he says, get up and move the table, that's protecting your situation just as much as calling, you know, the biggest angels on the planet in. But we don't, we didn't want to see a spectacular spectacle to think, look what we did in our faith movement, okay? Well, let's bring this, let's bring this to reality. We should not go march in protest all over the planet knowing the season we live in with no mask, no mindfulness of social distancing whatsoever, or attend these COVID-19 parties <laughs> and tempt God. Because you're a big fig person. No, you're a big fool. <laughs> I mean, sometimes a move of God and the and the, the the faith that comes from God is just being in tune to God. Amen. It's the little things. Amen. You know what? It's the little foxes that destroy the vineyard, but it's also the little voices of God that save the vineyard too. Amen. The tiny things, the little things. I mean, I have never seen the biggest bunch of babies over wearing a mask in my entire life at a church. <laughs> Guys, this is for real. I mean, we just cannot say, oh, you know what, I'm just speaking to that thing. This is not even true. You're a fool. This is true. And it ain't the first time it's ever happened. It's happened biblical times. It's happened in American times. And so we're foolish to think we're just going to only speak to things. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but only speak to it and live without any regard whatsoever. Like there's an existing thing going on that we need to have enough caring for the person around us and think beyond us. Because yeah. I'm a big faith person. Well, the person that you're trying to witness to thinks you're a big jerk. <laughs> Amen. Can we be real here? Amen. Can we be real here? Now, do we get in fear? See, this is the balance. This is the balance of all of this. No. And and quite frankly, I'm with probably a lot of you in this room. I think there's a little advantage being taken over right now. But that doesn't mean I'm going to disregard loving my brother in the midst of this because I want to be super spiritual and have spiritual pride. How did the Father protect Jesus? Jesus! We talked about this last week. He sent warnings. He didn't send angels. There was no fireworks in the sky and so everybody could see and know and, oh, jo Joseph, I'm a big faith person. Look what I did. Joseph, you know, painted across the sky. No. They were just the voice of God. The simple things in the common living of every single day. You know, I, I just want to say to you, I do, like, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see people given rewards who maybe we didn't see big spectacle lives in. But maybe they were so in tune to the practical voice of God in from what to cook for dinner to when and where to leave the house. Do you know that that's a spectacle in God's heart? That's as big of a spectacle as, you know, Joe Schmo going out and, that, you know, everybody lines up and they all get healed, delivered, and set free. It's, it's the same thing. You've got you to listen to God. He doesn't operate like that. Are you with me? I'm, I'm giving you so much more than we had this morning. You know, Jesus protected, Je God protected Jesus, the Father, through warnings. God knew what Satan's plans were for Christ through Herod. And so they were in tune. They were in tune to that destruction. And so they were in tune to that instruction, I should say. Sometimes we just make things too complicated. Because we think faith has to be a, spe a spectacle. Mm, I just declare a holy disregard from all of that. And if we can just get 
back to the basics. My sheep know my voice, mm -hmm. and a stranger they don't follow. Do you know that's a faith statement? Mm -hmm. That's just as much of a faith statement as, and these signs will follow those that believe. Mm -hmm. sure. And all these spectacle visuals. Well, just listening how to minister to your husband. You don't think that matters to God? <laughs> and all the men said, Amen. okay. <laughs> no, I it. Yes, so right? This is, this is how we're going. So, so we're not, Jesus did not jump off the pinnacle, did he? He listened. There was basic instruction that was given. Sometimes there are co the complication that we bring faith to, you know who's behind it? The devil. When we make faith too complicated, he is right there behind it, just like he was with Jesus here, trying to get us to jump off the pinnacle. Listen, if Satan tells you to jump off the pinnacle or stop wearing your mask or whatever it is you hear, first thing you want to be is why? Don't just follow blindly because some word is given to you out of context. Why put yourself in a position where you need swooping angels to rescue you when you have no reason to jump to begin with? Be careful. Be careful. I believe that's the warning that the Holy Spirit's given in this room today. Be careful of spiritual pride. You can have spiritual pride. See, the occult also draws people in the same way. Power, the power gifts. Yep. Let's face it, if we, if we were really honest in here, if we had any gift at all we could pick, we'd all pick the power gifts. Amen. Because there's something in our flesh that we're drawn to that, okay? Amen. We need to ask the Lord how he wants things done. Amen. Ask him how to walk in, in Lord, in, in my life, and your omnipotence, what in me would please you as a faith walk? Amen. It's not going to be the same for everybody in this room. Amen. And probably for most of us, it's certainly, there'll be some spectacle here and there, but not every day, all day. And if we start chasing spectacles, then we're not chasing Jesus anymore. Mm. Amen. You know what Jesus did after that? I hate to ruin your story about this. But you know what Jesus did? The angels did not come. He didn't jump. And they all came in wisdom. And, you know, star stripes and banners said, Jesus is Lord in heaven. There was none of that. He just climbed down off the mountain after he straightened out of what the word really was. No spectacle. No big thing took place. There was no eclipses, no flying angels. Matthew 12, 14 and 15 tells us this. When the Pharisees went out and plotted against Christ, how they might destroy him, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. Again, no big, I'm a fiery puke, I'm going to, we're, come on guys, we're going to take care of this, let's go get them. And it was none of that. It was basic knowledge that he, the Son of God and God the Son took instruction with and from and he followed the basic instruction. And guess why? It was just as powerful as any of these other things that we think ought to happen in faith. He was protected. Yeah. Acts 14, 5 and 6. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. And when a violent intent was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware. Uh-huh and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. This is the great apostle Paul. This is, this is, and he fled? I mean, the word fled, you know, it, it, it's actually one of the, this, this translation of fled, you know, that's, that, that gives the impression of, now, let's get out of here. <laughs> well, wait a minute, Paul, we got the word from Walmart coming out. We'll get it later, we're out of here. You see what I'm saying? That's not fear. We're, we're sometimes judging people for things that we're deciding or fear because we're the faith, faithful Frank on the standing story. Right? Not Paul. God wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and the instructions to the church more than anybody else wrote. This man was a man of faith. He knew Jesus. Why didn't Paul just stand there 
Mary prove, hey, I'm, who you, you know who you're talking to? A.P. Apostle Paul. <laughs> right now, he didn't do any of that. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. He didn't try to prove who he was through God. And neither did Jesus on most of the account. You know, Jesus did more ordinary things than he did spectacular things. Of course, we know the greatest thing he ever did was give his life for us. But up until then, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Jesus put his clothes on every day and he ate, you know, <laughs> breakfast like you do. And, you know, very life like a, a man would live. But see, we look at the spectacular and we think our entire life should be filled with that. But no, Jesus' entire life wasn't filled with that. Sometimes he fled people who were trying to kill him. Oh, yeah. Amazing to me. Over and over, they knew something, that God was making them aware of something, and it was for their protection. It would do us good to not over-spiritualize everything. Yes, I do believe that everything is darkness or light, but we can over-spiritualize it. And you know what happens? We walk right into the enemy's trap of spiritual pride. Mm -hmm. Jesus, jump, jump over here. Why? Why should I do that? Jesus knew. Jesus knew that if he had given in to that, to listen, if he had to prove it even, that would be tempting God, and it would be fulfilling Satan's mission, which is to bring pride in our life. Because Satan is the one that was first filled with pride, and that's one of his mission. That if he can't keep you out of heaven, if he can't keep you from getting born again, if he can't keep you from your identity, he'll fill you with pride. Because that's the nature of the dragon. Don't miss this, church. Don't miss it. If someone says, don't go down that path, there's a big old mean rattlesnake. I saw it every day last week. You don't need a special word from God not to go there. <laughs> right. Well, no, wait, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You know what? I am Frank, Frank the Faithful. So I'm going to pray in the Spirit for an hour about this. I don't know. And I'm going to call my small group and have them pray in the Spirit for an hour. And I'm going to stand on the word. You don't need a special word from the Lord to go down that path. You need a special word to go on the work to on the path from the Lord to go on that path. Amen. Do you see the opposite of that? We tend to go because we think faith is a spectacular spectacle that we need to be seen and everyone else to see. When the truth is, He gives us these warning things here and there, instructions here and there, and it's not we don't go there and then wait for the deliverance to come. How about we wait for the word? To, to go someplace that he's warned us about before we go. Amen. Not after. Right. I, I, I feel like I'm not saying that right. You need and I need a special word to go down the path you've been warned at. Right. Not, not, the, not the deliverance afterwards. Do you see the difference? I mean, do you really see the difference? Yeah. I had a lady last week call me, we've been studying the Bible with her a very long time together on Tuesdays, and she's like, I just don't know what to do. Um, she wants to go have this family gathering in a state that's numbers are up, curves up with this virus, and you know, we've got a lot of money planned here, we've got a lot of time spent, we've got all these kind of things we've got going on. And you know, my statement to her was, well, who, what's leading you? The money you got spent in something, and I'm saying to you that the, the emotion that's being put there. You know, there, there's, a, there's a danger here. Let's face it, we're all living it right now. I'm looking at a congregation with the realization of that. And so my, my suggestion to her, and direction and counsel, and it is to you too, like, you can give an instruction. Now you need to hear what God says to you about that. And he may say go. He may have a mission for her, but if he says go, you'll still be protected. Right. See, what we do is we go anyway, and then we go, oh, well, that's Psalm 91. You know, it's a nice song, but it doesn't really work. Because we never really ask the Lord for direction personally for us. 
just because Steve is okay to go do something doesn't mean Rosetta is okay to go do something. We have our own shepherd. Our own personal shepherd. While there's collective and generic words for all of us, there's individual direction and guidance as we trust and acknowledge him and not lean into our own ways. And sometimes, I think this is most dangerous for people who've been in the faith a long time because we want to be an example to others that we are a faith person. But we've got to be careful not to let that bridge take us over to spiritual pride in the, in the issue. Do you see what I'm saying with that? So again, amazing. You know, Paul, it, it just, he didn't confront anything. He followed the instructions. So I said to this, this, this woman, you, you need to hear from the Lord. Drowned out every other voice, because this one's saying that, and that one's saying, listen, there's a lot of voices right now, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, I think there's more voices now than there has ever been in the history of my entire life. I mean, they're just coming up, hey, hey, hey. It's like, you have to, like, literally go somewhere. It's like, it's drowning voices constantly. But you know what? His is still there. But you know what? Like Elijah, he had to hear it through an earthquake, through all kinds of other things. It's a still, small voice. He is not going to scream over Satan. Because he wants us to seek him in the secret place to hear it. And we will hear it. We will hear it if we spend our time doing that. We go to Acts 22, 17, 18. Now what happened when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him, we're talking about Jesus and Paul, say to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive the testimony that you're going to give concerning me. Wow, what an experience. Now, there's a spectacle, but it didn't happen before anybody else. It happened between God and Paul. And he had this vision, and he actually saw Jesus, and he heard Jesus' voice talk to him. And he didn't say, well, oh, you're, you're that faith guy. I'm so proud of you. And he said, get out of here as fast as you can. <laughs> See, we think that's fear. And sometimes it is. Is it, is, what, is it the instructions from the Lord? Because what can look like fear to one person could be faith to somebody else. Oh, man, that is just, thank you, Holy Ghost, for that. Hmm. Hmm. Hurry up and leave. Well, I just need to pray about this. Why? Why do you need to pray? If God tells you to leave, you leave. Amen. Who are you going to pray to? The one you pray to just told you to go. <laughs> this guy's ministry is the bedrock of the church that we sit in. Collectively, yet no big spectacle, no big, you know, fireworks in the sky. He just took the warning and he left. The only way, and I close with this, the only way that you and I, just as the Apostle Paul, you know what he went through? <laughs> this whole room wouldn't suffice to all he went through in one body. Read Corinthians, he'll tell you that many times he was shipwrecked and stoned and died and saw a vision. He actually went to heaven for goodness sake. Right? Amen. And, and, and I mean, this is this guy obeyed without a spectacle whatsoever. It's the bedrock of the church. No spectacle whatsoever. And the <clears throat> only time that you and I should do anything else beyond what we hear and the warnings that we see, even in the natural, is if the Lord says to do something different. Not go do it, call it faith, and expect him to fix it. Amen. You need, I need, we need a strong word from God when we're called to go against the flow in that way. Amen. I mean, I will give you an example. Our, um, Pastor Dan and Vineland, um, they went to Italy, him and his wife. Do you remember who I'm talking about? Nope. Scalia, Scalia, yeah, Ar Pastor Ari Scalia. He, wonderful guy, and all of a sudden I see on Facebook, at the height of this Italy situation, you know, that was really a hot spot. Mm -hmm. They were called there to just to go and be missionaries. Oh, yeah. that, that's a calling. That's not somebody just trying to be some faith person. 
I mean, you know, I had a little instant messenger back and forth with him, like, and when that's got, and they were productive. They were in the throes of that. Right. Now, for all of us just to pack up and say, oh, well, there's a need over in Italy. We should, that's just not someplace you want to go to. You want to hear from God. Amen. Even as repairs of the breach go out each week and they're dealing with people, they're going into spiritual warfare zones and Satan is mean and he's nasty and he's ugly and he's got some power. That's not as much as we have, but he has some. That, that's got to be prayed through. You just don't go walk into something like that and just say, hey, clear off this place. You know, the fake man's here. That's we have nothing in and of ourselves. Right. That's a calling that you need a strong word from God Amen. to go into an arena like that with the power and authority that you desire to have in Christ for his glory. Amen. 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 If it's not the word of God and you feel you have to prove yourself to anybody it's tempting God. That's what we learn here out of Matthew 4. When Jesus said, it also says. It was tempting God if he had to prove himself to Satan or anyone else. So I'm going to end here saying, take hold of that. Take hold of that. We all want to grow in the Lord. But you know, his ways aren't our ways. Being the, the, the person on, you know, ch the, 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 the church illustrated jour uh, journal every week isn't necessarily what he, the calling he has for each one of us. Mm -hmm. We're going to hear what he wants us to do in our faith walk. Our faith walk. Not hers, not his, not mine, not yours. Mine. I, I would I was I would ask today. In fact, why don't you bow your head and let's just ask the Lord together? So Father, as we depart now, I thank you for this such a simple word. Such a simple word. And yet, Lord, the closer we get to the end, we want to do exploits for you. Yeah. The word says we can do some of it, but not every minute of every day. And Lord, may our lives be faith-filled in the little things that you show us, in those tiny things that are instructional, that come from the north, south, east, and west. And may we bring all those things to you to know what's in and what's out. And that our personal walks, Lord, you said it's impossible to please you without faith. Lord, I pray that this family of yours in this room will get with you today and, and wrestle this out if need be. What will please you in my faith walk, Lord, today, in this season, and in this time? I give no place to the devil or man to prove anything. Show me. You said you would speak to your sheep and I won't hear and I won't follow a stranger. In the name of Jesus, we say this as a fast. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Pastor Deb, thank you for that message. Sometimes we have the word of God and then we have to apply our common sense to it. So, a good word in due season. Thank you, Pastor Deb. I'd just like to thank everyone